This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. We've looked at what might be called ordinary controls that you would typically see in uh, sales systems, purchases systems, wages, inventory, cash, and of course the capital expenditure. We now have to uh, spend a short while looking at uh, controls which you would expect to see in a computerized accounting system. And by and large, these are kind of on top of the controls we've already looked at. You still need authorization. You still uh, need to ensure that there's a complete and watertight audit trail from the start of a transaction to its finish. Computer controls divide into two uh, families. First of all, there are what's called general controls. These are sometimes regarded as controls over the kind of environment in which the computer system is sitting. Uh, these are not uh, controls specifically for the wages system or sales system or purchases system. They are to do with the, the setting almost uh, which the computer system is operated in. And these controls should uh, be uh, uh, exercising some sort of discipline over the, the sort of items which are listed here. So, so development, development of new programs or the updating of existing software. Huge damage can be done if you make an error in software development or software modification. Uh, a few years ago, a, a very large bank in the UK did what they thought was a routine update to their system, but something had gone wrong in the coding of the new program that was being uh, made live. And it meant that many, many customers couldn't get access to their accounts uh, for over a week. They couldn't get money out of the, the autom autom automated teller machines. They couldn't find out what their balances were and the like, all because of probably one line of code, uh, which was wrong. We have to also uh, prevent unauthorized changes. Uh, and this could be changes which are, of course, uh, uh, triggered by a virus. Uh, and you just have to think of the uh, damage that can be done. If a virus comes in, it begins replicating itself. It wipes your uh, files, wipes the records of your receivables. Uh, you're going to be in severe trouble. Also, we should mention the uh, important controls that there ought to be uh, over hacking. And this is uh, normally controls which are brought in with something called a firewall. Uh, remember, if your computer is connected to the internet, then the internet is connected to your computer. Uh, and it means that, in theory, anyone who's on the internet could get access to your computer uh, if it wasn't for the presence of something that would stop that. And uh, again, there have been some very, some very, very famous hacking examples. The most recent and very serious one was hacking into the Sony system uh, and some uh, uh, films that hadn't yet been released uh, were copied out. Uh, all sorts of emails going to and from producers uh, about film stars and so on were released to the great embarrassment of the head of Sony who has now uh, had to resign. Uh, uh, one of my friends uh, works for Sony He's in the sales department. He sells films. He's quite high up. Uh, but he was going along to clients to try to sell films, programs, and so on. Uh, and even in London, uh, had no idea really what they'd previously sold those clients or what prices they'd charged uh, because all of this historic data was also lost. Uh, and it took him a long time to kind of reconstitute that data you should, of course, take backups. Uh, you should take copies of the data and you should take these copies and store them in a remote location and so on. Uh, but what happens if the, uh, the hacker has been uh, playing clever and has actually been doing damage for maybe several months before you know, then it could be that all these backup copies are also irreparably damaged and uh, you're not really going to get your data back again. So these uh, general controls uh, over access, uh, almost physical uh, uh, controls as well to make sure that your computer and your files are simply not physically stolen uh, and then the information can be uh, perhaps released. 
very important. Very important indeed, especially as more and more uh, companies rely on the integrity of their data for not only their f financial statement records, uh, but lots of all, lots of other operational data. And then we have something which is called application controls. Called an application controls because these are specific to a particular application, the sales cycle or process, the purchases process, uh, paying wages, uh, perhaps uh, in construction contracts in a large uh, uh, manufacturing or construction company. What we want to be careful of here uh, is that the input of the initiation is correct. Uh, what is a characteristic of computers tends to be if you put in wrong information at the start, uh, then the system will just kind of process that come what may uh, without necessarily any, any kind of common sense intervention uh, leading to that data. It has to be recorded completely and accurately. We have to make sure it's processed accurately. Uh, and, and finally, we have to make sure that the results uh, are given to the people who should be getting those results. It needs to be a form of confidentiality. Uh, if you think about people's wages and salaries being processed on computer, you don't want anyone just to be able to, to log in and get access to, to, to your wages and salaries. What are the uh, various uh, ways uh, Oh, here, oh, sorry, here we have the input of processing controls over what's called standing data controls over output. Uh, this mentions here uh, something called standing data, uh, and standing data is sometimes called reference data. This is data uh, which is referred to, which is used, but which doesn't change very much. It's, it can always stand still. Uh, and the sort of data that you uh, have here uh, would be, say, an employee's name, an employee's bank details. They, 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 you know, pretty, pretty kind of static. Uh, the employee's rate of pay is probably going to change once a year. Uh, prices of goods, the selling price of a good is only going to change fairly rarely. This has to be contrasted to transaction data. So every sale you make, uh, there'd be different quantities of goods sold, there'd be different types of goods sold, they'd be sold to different people, that's transaction data. Uh, it, it tends to uh, be effective once, so to speak, uh, but the standing data, uh, the, the price of an item that you're using to raise your invoices, is going to be used over and over and over again. And a characteristic of the standing or reference data here is because it's referred to over and over and over again, one error can give you uh, many. So you get the selling price of an item wrong on uh, the inventory file or some of you many invoices uh, which are incorrectly priced. And again, there have some been some fairly famous examples of this. Uh, it often happens in air, not often, but occasionally happens in airlines where instead of typing in a fare of, let's say, $500, they get it wrong and type in a fare of $5. And of course, uh, the news of this very good value fare sweeps around the internet pretty quickly, and they find they've got a lot of full flights, but none of them actually making any profit. Uh, and most airlines say this is an obvious mistake, and they, uh, they reverse the contract, they won't hold you to it. But this reference data, it sometimes takes a special measures because if you think of somebody's pay, you kind of put it on, what's the incentive to check their pay again that it hasn't changed or that it was uh, you know, put on correctly in the first place? Similarly with the selling price, you, you update the selling price, there's not much incentive maybe to keep examining the selling price to see if it's correct. And what you tend to have to do with a lot of standing data is you actually print it out. You print it out at least once a year you distribute the data to the people who should know whether it's right or wrong, and you get them to say, yes, that's, that's right. They have to kind of verify these items of information individually. Real-time systems. Uh, real-time systems, this is where you, most systems are real-time nowadays, you, you log on and you can process a sales transaction in real-time. 
uh, a customer rings up and places an order, it's kind of typed in real time and a dispatch is triggered. Uh, internet systems, ordering of the internet are very much real time systems as well. If you order something from Amazon, Amazon you know, immediately grabs the money from your credit card account and the whole process of the, the picking and packing and dispatch of the goods is pretty well automated from, from then on. The problem with some of these uh, real-time systems uh, is that uh, there's a bit of informality about it. Uh, you have a sales team, a, a telephone force, if you like, of 12 people. A customer rings up, speaks to one of them. Uh, and somebody puts in that order but puts it in incorrectly. Uh, how do you know which one of those 12 salespeople was responsible for putting in that order? If there's a query on it, to whom do you go to? If there's an error... Uh, who do you have to maybe reprimand or put an extra training and, and so on. We also have to be wary of a, a lot of uh, computers just kind of sitting around the office on a network. Uh, and maybe during lunchtime, uh, nobody much in office, somebody comes in and begins, begins doing their own transactions on a computer which has been left live. So one of the first things you need is access controls. Access controls historically have been through passwords. Though increasingly biometric methods are being used, your, your fingerprint or uh, your, your retinal pattern or something will probably become more common in the, the future. You have to control the passwords. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, passwords don't become generally known. Uh, and you know we may have seen situations where somebody's sitting there, this is their computer monitor, and up here there's a little bit of a, a piece of sticky paper and they have a password on it, or the password is in a bit of paper in the top right hand uh, corner of the, the desk, and that's that's not too good at all. Uh, some people, uh, you know, you're warned against having passwords of one, two, three, four, five, or uh, uh, the, the like. Some companies take the view that what they will do is to issue you with a password, a mixture of uppercase, lowercase, numerical uh, 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 characters, and so on and insist you use that, then they change it every three months. The difficulty with that is, if you have a very complicated password, you kind of have to write it down to remember it. Uh, other companies say you can choose your own password, choose something memorable but obscure, uh, but again, they could, they could enforce a kind of rule where you have to change this memorable password every six months to try and make sure that the security is maintained. Uh, a programming uh, control... Uh, a programming uh, control is uh, uh, where, where you have to say, well, who can run what programs, really? Uh, who is allowed to run the wages program? You don't want it to be run twice a week or twice a month or whatever's going on. Transaction logs. Uh, transaction logs will allow you to print out a list of all the transactions which have been processed in the day. This can pr pr provide quite a useful audit trail so that you can trace back and see maybe exactly who did did what. The really good way of uh, organizing your passwords is if when somebody logs on, then every transaction which they process subsequently can be kind of tagged with an identifier so that they know they do something wrong and can be traced back to, back to them. Uh, file controls, so to make sure we're using up-to-date files uh, and not processing a file maybe from... Uh, a week ago. Balancing, making sure the trial balance balances, making sure the uh, uh, control accounts reconcile to the sum of the individual accounts and so on. Pre-processing authorization. Uh, who is going to access, who is going to a big button, authorize a salary rise? Uh, how do we know someone has authorized a salary rise? Uh, and very often still salary rises significant changes in pricing, uh, maybe setting a credit limit for a new customer. You want a piece of paper that you can go to. So instead of this being a computer screen, this is now a kind of salaries amendments document. We'll call it a SAD. No, it should be happy. Uh, and somebody will authorize that physically uh, and nobody will type in a new salary uh, until they get uh, this document. Systems development and maintenance controls. Systems uh, development and maintenance controls are uh, very important. 
uh, we have to be kind of a little bit uh, uh, just see careful about uh, using let me just get rid of that then I have got some space here I uh, have to be a bit careful about updating programs to some extent this is going to overlap uh, here with the development okay so we're just expanding some of the care we need with the development of new programs and new systems if I were going to commit a fraud using a computerized accounting system I have a bit of a choice but let's say what I'm going to choose is I'm going to commit this fraud through the salary system because of course I'm going to be paid a monthly amount anyway uh, and it's maybe not going to raise immediate concerns really I've got two ways of committing the fraud through salaries uh, the first method which I have is I can change my salary so let's say I manage to find the right logon details that gives me the access gives me the authority to go to the salary system and to change my own salary okay so I double the salary, put it up five times or 10%, whatever you think is best. Uh, whether it's best to commit a small fraud frequently or a big fraud once, I'll leave up to you. Uh, but I would, I would suggest that uh, if this fraud is discovered, this overpayment to me is discovered, one of the first places they will look is they will look at my salary information on this file and they will see it's wrong. Uh, and furthermore, uh, it could be tagged with my identifier so they know that it was me who changed my salary. So the game would be up. The other way I, I could go about committing a salary fraud is not by changing the data, changing the salary, but is by changing the salary processing. So uh, here we have the, uh, the salaries, uh, the program that we're going to change. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a little what's called a little decision box here. And I'll say is employee equal to X. Well where, where X would be my 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 employee number or some identifier of just me me. So as we're processing maybe thousands and thousands of people's salaries, everyone is saying, is it is it employee one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, you know, or whatever my salary identifier is. And as soon as it gets the answer yes, it'll branch off. Okay. Most salaries and most people that will go straight through this because they are not the particular uh, uh, employee code represented by X here. And what I do here is I put in a little line of code here, salary equals salary at times 10 or times 100 or whatever. And then it'll just kind of uh, join on again. And that can be done in a, in a programming language in one line of code. Uh, it's one extra line of code, maybe out of thousands of lines of code in an accounting system. And I would suggest that tracking down this change is going to take a long time. I would say this is the more successful way of committing a fraud. More obscure way, certainly, than doing it through changing data. Now, I've, I've kind of dramatized this by giving the example of salaries. Uh, but most errors which happen in, in accounting systems are innocent errors. Uh, you know, what would happen if the, the VAT changed? Uh, let's say, uh, you know, the, the VAT uh, went from, say, 20% uh, up to, uh, you know, let's, let's say it went to 15%, okay? So when you're working out what the, uh, uh, the VAT is, you should be saying something like, you know, the VAT, it used to say, equals uh, the net net times 0.2 that was the old one uh, but by error the uh, the programmer puts in for the new one that equals net 
times 0.015. So essentially charging a 1.5 rate of VAT rather than the 15% rate of VAT. Uh, and, and all the invoices are now going to go out incorrectly. They're not going to add enough VAT, VAT but the government will insist that it gets its 15% on the sales. Uh, and this can, you know, could this innocent error of getting the decimal place in the wrong place could ruin the company. So it's very, very important uh, that when programs are changed or systems are developed, that they undergo very thorough testing uh, to make sure there's no error like this, uh, to make sure that they don't work so slowly that they're going to irritate your, your customers uh, and uh, you're going to be losing sales. Now, if we just go back here uh, a little bit uh, and just look at the types of control uh, that might exist over the input of uh, data. So let me just get rid of this stuff on reference data and we'll look here once again on the input controls that might be possible just to give a, a little selection of them. Remember the importance of input controls is that once something is put into the computer the chances are it's just going to churn on doing its calculations even though the input was obviously rubbish. What we're particularly interested in in input is making sure well let's say it's been authorized already but then we have to make sure it's input completely and accurately completely and accurately how can we uh, try to to solve these problems and there are about uh, five six ways in which you can do it uh, first of all you can something called edit checks There's a whole family of edit checks. So, for example, you can have a range check. So a range check means that you can't put in a number which is outside a range. So if you are uh, trading six days a week, and what you're supposed to be putting in is one to six to denote what the trading day was, this wouldn't allow you to put in the number seven or eight or anything of that sort. Uh, sometimes it can be done by a drop-down menu. That's almost a, a range uh, uh, test. Uh, menu drops down. You have to choose one of these things here. You can't be putting anything which is, you know, desperately wrong. You can have a format check. So when you're putting in your credit card number, there's 16 digits in the long number along the front. If you put in the wrong number of digits, uh, it will immediately come back to you and say that that's wrong. This cannot be a valid credit card number because it's 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 it's, it's not conforming with the format that we require. Or again, you're asked to put in your date of birth. You have to look quite carefully if it's day day month month year year, or if it's day day month month year 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 uh, to get it right. It will spit it back at you if you get that wrong. You can do things called dependency checks. A dependency check is where one piece of data implies something about another piece of data. And again, you've almost certainly uh, uh, experienced this, maybe when, when booking airline flights uh, or booking a stay in a hotel. Uh, sometimes one contrives to book the return journey at a date earlier than the outgoing journey. And, and it recognises this, it will say, you can't, you can't come back before you go kind of thing. Uh, that's a dependency check. There's nothing wrong with either date independently, but together they don't make sense. And the last one we'll have here is what's called a check digit. A check digit test is where a number like a part number or an account number uh, has been specially constructed so that when you do a bit of the arithmetic on it, it, it produces a certain result. So a very simple check digit test uh, would be whatever 
part number you have, let's say it's all numerical, if you divide by, let's say, 13, it will divide even if by 13 there's no remainder. Uh, the chances of you typing in a number incorrectly, which still divides by 13 with no remainder, is very small. And a lot of large numbers are V18 numbers in the UK, but a sophisticated check digit uh, test to try to identify inaccuracy on the input. Second one, and this is going to do accuracy. Second one we can look at is a sequence check. A sequence check is going to do uh, completeness. So for a sequence check, you need to be putting in essentially numerically pre-numbered documents. A good, a good example is checks in the checkbook. They're all uniquely and sequentially numbered. All the system has to do is to you know, keep a record of all the check numbers submitted. And if you try doing one twice, it'll object. And it will print out a, a list of missing check numbers at the end of the period. Uh, or perhaps warn you that you seem to be missing out a couple of numbers when you go to process some some check payments. Sequence check does completeness, doesn't really do accuracy very much. There is a matching test. Good example of matching is, let's say, everybody in the organization is expected to submit a timesheet every week. Uh, and all it has to do is say, well, here are the employees, uh, here are the timesheets we've got to look, this one is is missing. You know, this person hasn't submitted a timesheet or a clock card. And this is essentially going to do completeness. Again, we, we maybe have examples of that in the, let's say, the purchases system. Uh, we have a file of purchase in, about being about purchase orders, which we have issued to suppliers. Uh, and then when we get goods received coming in, we match the goods received notes to the orders. Uh, and automatically it will say, look here, there's this order which is not yet matched with receiving goods. Perhaps something has gone wrong with that. That's primarily completeness. You have something which is called one-for-one -one matching. And one-for-one -one matching is used for what I call awkward data. So you have a new employee who joins. Uh, you have to put in this person's name and their address. Uh, and quite obviously their name and address isn't going to con conform with a, a particular format, uh, a particular range of values and check digit. This is very awkward, unique data. And the only way you can deal with new employees, new customers, new suppliers, perhaps new parts with a fancy description, which don't comply with any pattern of data, is you put it in, you get a printout of what you put in, and then you compare that one-to-one, -one, eyeballing it really, uh, to look for discrepancies. This will do if you keep a record of all of these documents, both completeness and accuracy. And the final one uh, is going to be a uh, batch total or a control total. Again, this can do both completeness and accuracy. Let's say I have a, a bunch of three invoices I want to put in. So what I do is I got my invoices. And my, my invoices have on them 100, 150, and let's say 80. So 250, you've got uh, 330. I put a total on there. This is what's called a batch header or a batch total. So when I'm putting in these three invoices, I've already pre-listed them, added them up. I'm kind of telling the computer, look, 330, I put that in first. And I say, the sum of the invoices coming in next should match to 330. And quite obviously, if I mistype the 150 as 140, it isn't going to reconcile. If I turn two invoices kind of over at once and missed one of them, it's not going to reconcile either. Batch controls were a very powerful 
method of controlling accuracy and completeness. But you did have to have a batch. You know, you did have to let the transactions kind of accumulate maybe to the end of the week and then process them. This doesn't work in real time systems where you tend to be processing items in a way one at a time and the concept of a batch is simply not there.